Well, back in the days when our four boys were growing up, Sunday night was always family night at our house. And so over the years, we developed um, several traditional family um, traditions, I guess you'd say, on Sunday evenings. We'd have a family meeting where we would uh, go over whatever they were learning in Sunday school, go over their Sunday school papers, talk about the week that was coming ahead. And some of those family meetings went better than others, but we'd have them. And then mom would go and make popcorn, and I'd make my, uh, my famous homemade chocolate peanut butter shakes, which are awesome, by the way. And we would enjoy those. And then we'd watch a half an hour or so of TV, usually something on the Discovery Channel about animals, and then we'd have a family prayer time. I still remember one of those Sunday evenings when our boys were quite young, maybe ages seven, five, two, and a baby. And we were at the point in the family night when we were just watching TV. So there were the five of us boys, including myself among the boys, and we were in various states of lounging on the couch or lying on the floor with pillows, you know, quite comfortable, glued to whatever was happening on the TV, uh, maybe something about uh, killer whales or dolphins or something, and my wife went in to make the popcorn. Well, a few minutes later, she came back with uh, individual bowls for all of us, individual bowls of popcorn, and uh, we received them uh, kind of like ancient Mes Mesopotamian kings, you know, just receive our popcorn bowls while never moving our eyes from whatever was happening on TV. Now, mind you, none of us had gone in to help her make the popcorn. None of us had volunteered to help carry the bowls back to the family room. We just received them. And none of us even thought to say thank you, except the two-year-old. And the two-year-old bursts out with this spontaneous and genuine and joyful, thank you for the popcorn, mommy. And immediately, the other of us, the two older boys and myself, knew that we had been exposed. <laughs> that our silence was deafening. So we all start to sort of bumble out our day late, dollar short Thanksgiving. Oh, oh yeah, hon, thanks for the popcorn. Oh, thanks, mom. But it, it, it was not enough. Rang a bit hollow because our lack of gratitude had been obvious. And I don't think the popcorn tasted all that good after that either. But we're in a summer series, beginning our new summer series today, called The Disciplines of Grace. And I don't know if it hit you this way when you saw the words on the screen, but those two words don't seem to go together. They sound a little bit like an oxymoron, because we tend to think of discipline as something that's hard, maybe even painful, something that requires great effort and commitment, like the discipline to lose weight or the discipline to get in shape. We think of grace as something good, something effortless and beautiful, a gift, kind of like chocolate cake. So how is discipline needed to enjoy grace? Who needs discipline to enjoy chocolate cake? But we put these two words together on purpose because discipline is what it takes to learn something, and that's what the word means. It means to learn or to be a learner, and grace is what God wants to give us. It's what he wants us to learn. And the truth is, we often struggle for all kinds of reasons to understand, experience, and to enjoy the very grace God is trying to give us. We have to learn. So that's what we're going to be doing this summer. And today we begin with the discipline of gratitude. The discipline of gratitude. We're going to be in one story today. It comes to us in Luke chapter 17. This little story about Jesus uh, is toward the end of his earthly life. So he's just weeks away from uh, the events that took place in Jerusalem, including the cross. So let's read the story beginning in Luke 17, verse 11. Now on, the way, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now I have to stop there because whenever you see a ge geographic detail like that, it matters. So take a look at this map. You'll see that... Uh, Galilee, where Jesus' home base was, was way to the north. You see it up there. Uh, Jerusalem, where he's headed, is way to the south. And between the north and the south is this region called Samaria. Now, some of you will remember that there was a centuries-long animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. And quite often, when Jewish people needed to move from Galilee in the north all the way to Jerusalem, they would choose to walk around Samaria, either to the east or the west, taking a detour so they didn't have to come into contact with the Samaritans because it created the conflict. You might remember that Jesus one time violated that tradition by walking straight through Samaria, and he did so because he had 
a kind of appointment arranged with the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. But in this particular case, we can see Jesus is probably planning to walk around because you see that little border line, the blue line at the top there? That's the border Luke's talking about between Galilee and Samaria. This would have been a kind of a no man's land between where the Jews lived and where the Samaritans lived. Now, why would Luke mention this specifically? The only place where he mentions this border uh, line area, we're going to find out as we read the story. Verse 12, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. Now the word translated leprosy here means literally scaly or rough. So 10 scaly men. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, this is a short story. Uh, very short, very pithy, and it reads almost like a parable. And it's a story with three movements, as it were. The first thing we see is the disease. The disease. I don't know about you, but middle school was not exactly my favorite season of life. Just out of curiosity, how many of you, if you could, go back, would go back to middle school? Anybody? Okay, some of you would. Most of you, as I guessed. Would not. Now, are there any, how many middle schoolers are here today? You're, you're a middle schooler, raise your hand. Okay, awesome, glad you're here, let me say something. While for many of us, middle school was not an awesome time in our lives, middle schoolers are awesome. At least we think you're awesome. And you matter, you matter to us as a church, we're glad you're here today. You matter to Pastor Andrew, our middle school pastor. You matter to God, because God has, has plans to use you in his purposes in the world. Maybe even this summer on one of the trips you're on. But when I was in sixth grade or so, I learned that middle school could be a pretty cruel place. It could be especially cruel for any student who had something about them that was different. Because anything that was different, maybe the shape of your body or your hair, or maybe you had braces or maybe you wore glasses, anything at all could be used to make fun and to tease, and usually was. And there was a girl in my sixth grade class whose name was Margaret Rubenstein. We called her Peggy, Peggy Rubenstein. And Peggy had several things about her that made her different. She was really, really small, very tiny in stature, looked like a third grader. She wore these, these teardrop glasses that she had on a, on, a, on a band around her neck. And she was really, really smart, like a brainiac. And at no fault of hers, that year she became kind of a target for teasing and for making fun. I remember feeling kind of bad for her that year. I don't think I participated in it, uh, but I also don't think I did anything to stop it. Well, I remember one day in particular, we were outside playing kickball. Remember kickball? It was recess time or gym class or something, playing kickball with those big red, you know, bouncy kickballs. And um, her, her, her turn came up to, to bat or to kick or whatever, and the pitcher was this big, big kid named Carl, one of these prematurely mature kids, you know, beard in sixth grade, all, just this big giant kid, and he was the pitcher. He rolled the ball, and Peggy was so little, she kicked it as hard as she could, she just kind of bunted it right back to him. And in kickball, you get someone out by throwing the ball at them. Carl scooped up that ball, took aim, and just drilled Peggy right in the back of the head. She went airborne, landed on her face, glasses flew off, she skidded in the dirt, and do you know what everybody did? We laughed. We laughed. Because Peggy had become a leper in some way, someone different. Some 30 years later, uh, I happened to go to a class reunion, the only one I've been to, and I saw Peggy, and the first thing I thought about was that kickball game. So I walked up to her, and I reintroduced myself, hadn't seen anybody, any of these people in 30 years. And I said, Peggy, I, something's bothered me for a long time. I, I need to apologize. And she stopped me. She said, I know what you're going to say. She said, it's okay. You don't have to worry about it. We were just kids. I said, no, I, I do. So I apologized. She was gracious. And we sort of laughed about it. But she still remembered that day. Verse 11, Luke says, now on his way to Jerusalem, 
Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. Notice, they're not identified as being either Jews or Samaritans here. They're identified by sharing the same disease. That's what made them unified. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, there's several things here. First, the condition is called leprosy. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Luke says there were 10 men. This would indicate that they were part of a colony. They were legally required to live outside of the healthy community in their own little community of sickness and disease. It says the lepers stood at a distance. We can pass this right over, but the phrase is full of meaning and full of pain. Now today, leprosy, often called Hansen's disease, has largely been eliminated from the Western world. It does still exist in places in the world, places like India, for example. It's, it's totally treatable now, but it's still feared in parts of the world. But at the time of Jesus, it was the most feared disease of the ancient world. The Greek word lepros that's used here means scales or scaly, as I said. It's used to refer to all kinds of infectious skin diseases from what we would call psoriasis all the way to full-blown leprosy. And the symptoms of leprosy usually began with um, white scaly patches on the skin. Eventually, it would infect the the, the extremities of the body. Lepers would eventually uh, experience terrible disfigurement of their extremities, particularly of the twisting of the limbs and a curling of the fingers. I could have showed you many pictures of this. This is one of the ones that's easier to look at. The leprosy would attack the nervous system, eventually compromising the body's ability to feel pain. Now, not being able to feel pain might sound like a good thing, but it's not. A leper might step on a broken piece of pottery and cut his or her foot and not realize it, and then that would get infected. The whole limb would be at risk. A leper's body then would move into a state of what's called living decomposition, meaning there would be a, a terrible stench about a leper or a group of lepers. On average, it took about nine years for leprosy to run its course, and a leper usually died a horrible death. But perhaps even worse than those physical symptoms was the social and spiritual impact of the disease. Way back in Leviticus chapter 13 in the Old Testament, we see instructions for how to deal with leprosy. Then the priest shall examine him. And if the disease swelling is reddish white on his bald head or on his bald forehead, like the appearance of leprous disease in the skin of the body, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. I'll explain that word in just a minute. The priest must pronounce him unclean. His disease is on his head. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So what does it mean to be a leper? Well, first it meant to be regarded as unclean. It's, it's difficult for us in our culture to even have any idea what it meant to be called unclean in that culture. It meant you were contaminated. It meant you were contaminated both physically and spiritually. It meant you were dangerous to other people. It meant no one could touch you lest they become contaminated. It meant you could not enter into another person's home because you would contaminate the whole home. Second, to be a leper meant to live outside the camp. You were, you were quarantined, sent away. And third, it meant there were all kinds of legal and social restrictions about your life. A leper had to warn the healthy population of his or her presence by shouting the word, unclean, an unclean one is coming, watch out. It was illegal to come within 50 per feet of a healthy person if you were a leper. People sometimes would throw stones at lepers just to keep them at distance. A Jewish historian named Josephus says that lepers were to be treated as dead men. In fact, it was common for families of lepers to eventually hold a kind of funeral service for them, even while they still lived in the, in the, in the colony. So it's almost impossible for us to think of a similar example in our modern culture. Perhaps the closest we could come is thinking of of people who were infected with HIV AIDS in the early days of that disease and our awareness of it. Or maybe a word like prostitute or sex offender or ex-convict, maybe homeless or mental illness. But a leper would be among the most marginalized of human beings. 
one that no one wants to look at, no one wants to be near, no one wants to see or love. So picture these men, disfigured, their stench going before them, dressed in torn and ragged clothes, and they shout in a loud voice, not unclean, but they shout, Master, have pity on us. This is interesting here. They call him Master. This is the only place in Luke's gospel where that title's used except for when the the 12 disciples are talking to Jesus. These men are the only ones to use the title master. So it seems that they know something about Jesus. They know something about who he is. Maybe they've heard, maybe they have hope beyond hope and they ask him not for healing but they ask for pity. The word means mercy, compassion. Jesus, master, help us. It's a cry of absolute desperation. Now, if we go back to Luke's introduction to this story, remember he said Jesus intentionally was walking along the border between Samaria and Galilee. We now know why. He went there on purpose because he wanted to come into contact with these untouchable, unlovable, disregarded people. That's the first thing we see, the disease. The second thing we see in the story is the healing. The healing. How many of you, and I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but how many of you are allergic to poison ivy? How many? Okay, I read where 85% of the North American population is allergic to poison ivy. Uh, and I wonder if you can remember the last time you got a bad case, you know, working in the garden, uh, golfing, looking for your golf ball, whatever, you got hands, legs, whatever. And you remember the last time you had poison ivy? Got it on your skin, the red rash, the burning, the itching, right? Now take that, however bad it was, and multiply it times 10. You can feel the, 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 the oozing, red, angry, you're miserable, okay? You can't sleep, you can't go out in public, you can't cover it up, you can't touch anyone, you don't want to touch anyone, you don't even want to touch yourself. So you go to your doctor hoping for relief, hoping he or she can help. Your doctor takes one look at you, does not write you a prescription for some magical you know, ointment, doesn't give you a shot of some sort of steroid that'll help, doesn't bandage you up and all that, just says this, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, put on your best bathing suit, and go to the nearest public pool and just show yourself to everybody. <laughs> He's like, what? But that's kind of what happens here, verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priests. Now, a couple things here. Notice it says, he saw them. Now, we can skip over that. Maybe it just means physically with his eyes he saw these lepers. But I think it might go a little deeper than that. You know how when you're in the city, maybe down in Chicago, and you're walking along the sidewalk, and you become aware there's someone sitting on cardboard over here, uh, shaking a cup, looking for help, and, you know, you're tempted to you know, look away. You're tempted not to look, not to see, because if you see, then you, you feel sort of obligated to something. See, I think here Jesus does the opposite. He doesn't look away. He goes there just to see these men. He sees them. He sees their uncleanness. He sees the outcast. He sees the throwaway people. He understood, and he cared. That's why he's there. Now, it occurs to me that maybe this morning there's someone here, maybe more than one, who in the recent season of life, maybe for a long time, have felt kind of invisible, like no one sees you or cares to see you, maybe not even God. But this story tells us something. It tells us that Jesus sees. He sees the one who feels invisible. He sees the one who feels outcast. He sees that's why he came, and he sees you today. That's what the story tells us. Then he says, go show yourself to the priests. Now, the priests were the ones responsible. Remember that Leviticus passage? They're the ones responsible for diagnosing leprosy, for keeping the community safe. So they're the ones who told these guys to go to the colony in the first place. Jesus says, go see those guys. Why does he do that? Because they're also the ones responsible to say you're now clean, to, to, to say you can enter back into the world. Notice, Jesus doesn't do anything outwardly to indicate healing or that he's going to heal. In Matthew 8, you may remember the story where he heals another single leper, but he does so by touching that leper. He touches them, that person, and the man becomes clean. He doesn't do that here. 
You might remember the story in John chapter 9 when Jesus spits on mud, makes a mud uh, potion and rubs it on a blind man's eyes and tells him to go wash off in the pool and he's healed. He doesn't do that here. He just sees them and he speaks to them. Go show yourself to the priests. It's a crazy thing to say to men who are covered with leprous oozing sores. You only went back to the priest once you knew you were clean. Now, why does Jesus do it this way? We don't really know. Luke doesn't tell us. Maybe he wants them to trust him. They've called him master. Maybe he wants them to believe that he really is. Luke just says, and as they went, they were cleansed. Now, I think this part of the story is also kind of about us. I think it's kind of about me. I think it's kind of about you. Maybe we don't have the physical disease leprosy, but in a way, we are all like lepers. We're all unclean in some way. We have some part of ourselves that we hide, that we hide from others, that some parts of ourselves that are untouchable. If I were to ask you, what's the most untouchable thing about you, or to ask you, what part of you is most unclean, we would all think of something. What do you carry around in the deepest parts of who you are that if others were to see it, you'd be pretty sure that they would turn away in disgust? We all have a place like that. Some secret sin, some shame that clings to us like a festering sore, anger, fear. Do you call him master? Do you call him master? And if you do, do you know he can make clean again? Even that? Luke says, as they went, they were cleansed. The word for cleansed here means being made ceremonially clean. means the external symptoms of the disease had disappeared. I'll come back and talk about that later. So we see the disease, we see the healing, now we see the response. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now, there are all kinds of things in these couple verses. Let me touch a couple of them. First, it shows us that gratitude begins with humility. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Only a humble man can show that kind of gratitude. This is a kind of desperate gratitude. Remember how the story started? They shouted in a loud voice, have pity. They were desperate. Here, he shouts in a loud voice, praise to God. He was as desperate in his thanksgiving as he was in his request for pity. Gratitude begins with humility. Secondly, gratitude is worship. Jesus says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Jesus links gratitude to praise, to worship. In fact, I think the Bible teaches us that worship is impossible without gratitude. Worship is impossible without gratitude. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You can't even come into God's presence to experience him at all without gratitude. I don't have time to deal with these things today but from Scripture, but I think prayer is the same way. I think prayer is impossible without gratitude. I think joy is impossible without gratitude because Joy cannot exist in a heart that is unthankful. In fact, the lack of gratitude, the Bible says, is the mark of Godlessness. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. But I also think there's something else going on here. Verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, here's the zinger in the story. When you read stories of Jesus in the New Testament, there's almost always a zinger. Don't stop thinking about them until you find it because there's one there. This is where the disciples who are likely traveling with Jesus here watching this whole scene unfold would have been shocked, maybe even offended maybe even embarrassed. Right here, Jesus should have our entire attention. He's saying there were 10 desperate men. All 10 were healed. All 10 were made clean. Only one 
returned to give thanks. And we think to ourselves, really? Really? Nine of the ten did not return? These were guys with leprosy for crying out loud. They're covered with festering, oozing sores. They're apart from their loved ones. They're going to die a horrible, stinking death. And only one comes back. Now, if we think that, if I caught you thinking that, it means we haven't found ourselves in the story yet. Here we see the one who does return is a Samaritan. That means he was a double outcast. He's a Samaritan and he's a leper. Unimaginable that Jesus would, start, would even talk to this man, let alone heal this man. To this man, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now, wait a second here. Hold on. Hasn't this man already been made clean as he was walking toward the priest? Hasn't, his, hasn't the leprosy already disappeared? What does Jesus mean is your faith has made you well? Well, the Greek word used here means healed, made well, or saved. He's talking about not just outward physical cleaning, not just a ceremonial kind of cleaning. He's talking about an inner healing, an inner cleansing, a transformation of heart. And this is the gospel in this story. Not an external cleansing of the body that comes through religious ritual or external focus, but a transformation of the heart. This is what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. The gospel always, always produces overflowing thankfulness. So here's a question. Why then are we so often the nine and not the one? It's a troubling question. I ask it of myself. I notice it of myself, not just with the popcorn, but when I pray, I pray and I ask, I ask for help and I, for all kinds of things, for people I love, from family, for the church and and God often gives these gifts, and I forget. I forget to go back. I forget to offer thanks. Why? I think it's because we live in a profoundly unthankful culture. We are taught from the time we're little that we don't have enough stuff, that we need more stuff. And so we assume somehow God is sort of withholding stuff from us. Gratitude is a spiritual choice, the story's telling us. Gratitude is is a discipline. Is it harsh? No. It's good. It brings worship. It's the gateway to worship and joy and cleansing. It's grace. It's like chocolate cake. But we need to learn how to enjoy it. We're going to end each of our messages this summer in this series with an application and sort of a personal challenge for you to grow in this particular discipline. So this week, our encouragement to you is, every day this week, whether you do this in the morning, typically, or in the evening before you go to bed, but take some time every day. Take some time and prayerfully think and write down, journal, a piece of paper, back of an envelope on, on your bulletin, write down five things for which you are profoundly grateful. And you can't repeat any of them any day. It's five different things every day. Just exercise the muscle of gratitude and see what God does in your heart. A couple days ago, I was looking at Facebook. I don't go on Facebook a lot, but this was something good. I saw a post by a friend of mine, ours, Karen Harper. Um, many of you know Karen. I asked her if I could share this post with you. She said I could. Most of you remember that Karen's husband, John, was our facilities director here at Chapel Street for about 10 years, and John passed away suddenly last July. This past week, June 6th, what would have been their anniversary, and Karen posted after having dinner with friends on that day. Here's her post. Celebrating my first wedding anniversary without John, but so incredibly blessed to have friends share a traditional, now non-traditional anniversary dinner to share with me the sweet memories I have of my amazing husband. Another first that ended the same as it has for the past 27 years. Humble 
Gratitude to God who put the two of us together in the first place. To God be the glory, she said. That's what it means to be the one. That's the discipline of gratitude. Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord Jesus, how we thank you for this beautiful story. We thank you for being the one who sees, loves, and heals the outcast, the broken, the leper. Thank you also for this one nameless man who returned to throw himself at your feet and give thanks. Teach us the grace of gratitude. Teach us to grow ever more grateful for your work in us and through gratitude to also discover the power of praise and prayer and the joy that you want to give. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.